Hello all. Um, today uh, we are going to go over contractualism. Uh, so this is uh, yet another ethical theory. Um, then next time we will go over uh, what's known as Rossian pluralism uh, and uh, virtue ethics. And that will uh, wrap up our discussion of different ethical theories. Uh, and uh, then we will move into the applied ethics portion of uh, the class. What, what you've been waiting for, right? Uh, since this is a, an applied ethics class. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you may have heard people talk about the social contract before. Uh, somehow we're all parties to a social contract or certain courses of action violate the social contract. Uh, contractualism uh, is going to identify moral principles with some kind of contract, right? Some sort of hypothetical contract. Um, Contractualist theories were very popular in the early modern period, philosophers say, so in kind of the 17th and 18th centuries, um, had a very big influence on the founders of the United States. Um, thinkers like Locke, John Locke, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, those folks, um, uh, very influential on the people who founded the United States. Uh, this was at a time, and these particularly people um, were interested in contractualist theories of so-called political authority. How is it that the government has the right to boss people around, all this sort of stuff, right? Um, so you have kings, uh, and uh, the kings usually claim divine right, right? The king says... Uh, I'm allowed to boss people around because God has placed me in charge. And um, people like uh, the people who founded the United States thought, uh, no, political authority is derived from the consent of the governed, right? Uh, somehow we as a group come together and draw up the rules that are supposed to uh, govern our society. Uh, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, et cetera, et cetera, right? Of course, uh, you know, they, <laughs> they had, um, they, they were pretty lacking in who they took we to be, right? Um, in practice, they only really incorporated uh, land-owning white men into their, into their social contract. Um, uh, but, you know, maybe, maybe the basic idea, uh, was, was onto something, right? And we're going to be interested in contractualist theories, not just of political authority, but of morality as a whole, or at least as we'll see of the morality of right and wrong, contractualist theories of what makes right actions right and wrong actions wrong. So as I say, these were very popular back in the day, um, revived in 1971 or so uh, by John Rawls, uh, my dissertation advisor's dissertation advisor, my philosophical grandfather. That's John Rawls right there. Uh, he wrote a book called <clears throat> A Theory of Justice, which provides a theory of justice. Uh, incredibly influential book. Um, so a, a citation is when some other academic work talks about one of your works. Um, a theory of justice has more than a hundred thousand citations according to Google Scholar. Uh, more, more than a hundred thousand uh, articles and books and so forth. Uh, that mention a theory of justice. It's not like they're all directly, you know, it's not like the whole thing is necessarily about it, but at some point they mention it or they cite something from it, they quote it, whatever. Um, Albert Einstein's most cited work, only about a fifth as many citations. So uh, a hugely, hugely influential uh, book. 
Um, there's also a musical about it uh, that, that you can find online. Um, <clears throat> I need a theory, a theory of justice. A theory no rational man can refute to render the rest of philosophy moot. All sorts of uh, <clears throat> songs, songs of, of that nature uh, in the musical. Um, also famous enough, there are some John Rawls memes. Uh, here's a, a fake Pokemon uh, card I found. Um, uh, one of Sc uh, Rawls' students, um, uh, Tim Scanlon, um, developed uh, contractualism further in another very prominent book in 1998 called What We Owe to Each Other. Um, so Scanlon, I guess, was like my philosophical uncle because he was my ad the, the student of my advisor's advisor, right? Um, uh, what we owe to each other, you may, if you watch the show The Good Place, you may recall that it plays uh, a very important role in uh, The Good Place. Um, it's mentioned uh, a number of different times. Um, it's also, uh, without spoiling anything, at the end of season one, uh, Eleanor writes uh, a very important note on the uh, title page of the book. Uh, you might uh, you might remember that. Um, so, what exactly is contractualism? Um, the basic claim for Scanlon is this: an act is wrong if its performance under the circumstances would be disallowed, not allowed by any set of principles for the general regulation of behavior that no one could reasonably reject as a basis for informed, unforced, general agreement. This is absolutely the central idea. Um, you can read that sentence uh, over and over again until it makes sense to you if it helps. Uh, so something is wrong if uh, were we to come together trying to find principles that could govern our behavior, uh, and we had full information, was informed, we were all, you know, voluntarily trying to find these principles without coercing other people into accepting what we want, that sort of stuff. It's unforced, general agreement, everybody is going to participate in this process. Um, if that... Uh, if, if, if any set of principles we could uh, agree to under those circumstances would rule out an action, uh, then the action is wrong. Um, if an action is not wrong, then it's permissible. If failing to perform it would be wrong, then it's obligatory. So if these principles uh, that would form the basis of our hypothetical social contract allow an action, then it's permissible. If they require an action, then it's obligatory. Um, so uh, to, to give a more concrete idea of what this means, imagine we all come together. And by when I say we all, that means we all, everybody in the world. Um, there's a question about non-human animals too, and we'll get to that later. But uh, we all come together, we're all going to agree to the rules that are going to govern our interactions with each other. Uh, and uh, we're all meeting in a very special sort of situation. We're all fully informed, we know all of the relevant facts, uh, we are all reasonable, uh, we're all responsive to the reasons that we actually have, uh, we're all uh, willing to work with other people. We're trying to find principles that are mutually acceptable to everybody. Nobody has any power over anybody else, any kind of unfair advantage. 
Uh, this is when he talks about informed, unforced, general agreement. This is what we're talking about. We're reasonable people coming together on equal terms, trying to figure out what should the rules be that govern our interactions with each other. Uh, now we suppose that each person in this situation uh, is trying to protect their own interests. So each of us is going to object to principles which hinder our interests. So uh, suppose somebody else uh, proposes the principle, um, anybody can take Dustin's stuff and Dustin isn't allowed to resist. And maybe if everybody else thinks, oh, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good principle, right? Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, because everybody wants to take my stuff. But of course, I'm going to veto that principle, right? I don't want anybody to just be able to come and take my stuff. So even if I get outvoted, still, I vetoed the principle. That principle's out, right? We're trying to find principles that everybody can agree on. And so because I veto the principle, principle is out. Um, but what are we going to do when we have cases of um, conflicts of interest? Maybe you and I want the same job. How are we going to handle that? Or maybe uh, I'm in need and you could rescue me, but you would, you would prefer not to rescue me because it would be very burdensome for you, very costly, uh, or whatever. How are we supposed to, to reach an agreement in these cases? Um, well, we're reasonable people and we're trying to find mutually acceptable principles, right? So this means if I have an objection to some principle, I will withdraw it if somebody else has stronger reasons for leaving the principle out. Um, sorry, for including the principle is what that should say. Let me just fix that. So, um, suppose we're considering the following principle. Uh, don't grade tests just by randomly rolling dice. Instead, you have to actually look at the tests and see how well the person answered the questions. Uh, and I think, oh no, I don't like that principle. I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to have to spend all this time grading tests, right? I would much prefer to just assign grades at random. Um, however, you guys could say, wait a minute, that's not fair to us, right? If you just roll, if you just roll dice and assign grades. Um, uh, we think that you, you need to actually read, read the tests and try to assign grades based on how well we actually answered the questions. And similarly, my bosses might say, hey, that's not fair to us. We're paying you uh, to teach these kids and to administer grades in a fair way that reflects how well they actually learn the material. We don't want you just randomly assigning grades. Um, and uh, presumably, uh, you know, if we think about this in a reasonable way, we're going to think, well, the interest you guys have in having your tests graded fairly is stronger than the interest I have in wanting to just randomly assign grades. And so, even though this principle imposes a certain burden on me, and it's not what I would prefer to do, I will withdraw my objection. I say, hey, I don't like this principle. It says that I have to grade tests fairly. I'd rather just randomly assign grades. You guys say, ah, but we have a stronger objection to you grading the tests randomly than I have to uh, 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 grading them fairly. And so I back down. I say, all right, fair enough. We'll do it your way. And so on for other, other moral cases of moral conflict, right? Uh, how much does, you know, the rich person owe, uh, to help, uh, people in need? Um, uh, we can ask, uh, similar questions. Well, who has the stronger stake here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
So um, when we have cases of conflict where people sort of thinking about their own interests would want different principles, what we need to do is kind of balance uh, different people's interests, see who has more at stake. And ultimately by doing this, by going through this process where, you know, I, I'm willing to go along with the principle that benefits you at my expense if you have more at stake, um, ultimately we will agree on a set of principles that nobody can reasonably reject. And those principles we agree on that nobody can reasonably reject, uh, those are the terms of the social contract. Those determine what we are morally obligated to do, what we are morally obligated to not do. So when we, if we agree on the principle, you know, don't kill other people outside of situations X, Y, and Z, uh, that's part of the social contract now, so it's wrong to kill uh, other people outside of situations X, Y, and Z, and so forth. Um, now, uh, what exactly are these principles going to be? I mean, what, what, it, what precisely is the social contract going to look like? Well, uh, the test for whether an action is permissible is you have to sort of imagine if you offer a justification for the action to the people who are affected by it, uh, would it be unreasonable for them to object to it? Uh, if I if I grade your your exams by rolling dice, and uh, then I I try to uh, justify myself by saying, well, I didn't want to spend the time grading them, it seems like it would be reasonable for you to object to my my justification, uh, and therefore I've I failed <laughs> I failed to justify myself to you. Right, action is not going to be permissible. Uh, on the other hand, you know. Suppose I'm running a, a medical triage and I'm trying to save the most lives and you ask me, wait, why am I not getting medical care that could help save me? And I say, uh, well, it's awful, but you know, I'm pursuing this policy that is aimed at saving the most lives. It might be that in that case, you know, you have to say, okay, I, you know, I don't really have a complaint against you. Of course, I would rather the medical care go to me, but, um, you know, I, I recognize how what you're doing is, is sort of impartially defensible, right? Now, probably when it comes to the actual content of these rules, most of the rules are going to look a lot like kind of the principles of ordinary morality. The sorts of things that rule utilitarians will endorse, the sorts of things that Rossian pluralists will endorse. We haven't talked about Rossian pluralists yet, but you'll see when we do what that means. If you've read the Ross reading, maybe you already know what kinds of principles they endorse. But the principles are going to be things like don't harm other people, help other people when they need help, keep your promises, this sort of stuff. Um, but uh, there are also, there are going to be some important differences between the contractualist view as Scanlon understands it and utilitarianism, even rule utilitarianism. Uh, and we're going to focus on kind of two big ones. Um, first of all, we've been talking about, you know, people having more or less strong reasons, reasons to reject principles, reasons to accept them. Uh, what it would be reasonable to accept or reject. Um, and uh, Scanlon takes this notion of, you know, reasons that you might have to be a little bit stronger, or sorry, to be a little bit broader than just your, your well-being. Um, so he takes it, one of the things you have reason to care about is your own well-being. So if something will decrease your well-being, that might be an objection you could raise to it. Um, but there are other things you might have reasons to care about that aren't necessarily about your well-being. He thinks you might have reasons to care about being respected, being treated fairly, being told the truth. Um, even if that doesn't necessarily uh, affect your, your well-being, 
those are things that you have uh, reason to care about in other ways. Um, so, for instance, to give you an idea of what's at issue here, suppose we're involved in some kind of cooperative endeavor. Maybe we are, uh, we are, you know, the town is going to flood and we're all building uh, a, a wall out of sandbags or something like that. Um, and you don't want to help. You, you correctly realize whether you help is not going to make any difference to whether the wall gets built uh, and prevents the flood or not, right? Uh, you realize there are enough people helping already. Uh, and furthermore, um, you know, people are just piling up as many bags as they can. So if you don't help, it's not even going to create more work for me, right? Uh, well, um, if you stay home and you don't help, uh, so it looks like that doesn't really hurt me in any way, right? We've stipulated it doesn't create more work for me and it doesn't make me any less likely to succeed in saving the town. Uh, sorry, if you hear noise in the background, it's because my cat is running around. Um, or, uh, suppose there's an important election, uh, to give another example. Uh, and I go vote and you don't vote. And suppose we know that the odds of your vote affecting the election are incredibly small. Um, and furthermore, the fact that you don't vote doesn't make it any harder for me to vote or something like that, right? Um, so you're sort of free riding on the contributions of others. You are uh, allowing other people to put in the work of, of building the sandbag wall to save the town and you're benefiting from that, but you're not contributing yourself or you're allowing other people to put in good grief, Apollo. He's really, uh, he's really got the zoomies. Hey bud. You're allowing other people to put in the work of going to vote. Uh, and, you know, you're going to benefit from them getting the right candidate elected, but you're not going to put in the work yourself. In that case, uh, free writing doesn't necessarily hurt you. The, the, the other person's free writing um, doesn't, doesn't necessarily hurt me. Um, but Scanlon thinks I can still object to it as sort of disrespectful towards me and unfair. It's unfair that I put in the work in this cooperative endeavor and you refuse to. Or um, the authors of the SCP, SCP, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article that you read offer this example. Imagine a situation where in order to preserve the grass, we need at least 90% of the people to avoid walking on the grass, but it doesn't do any, any harm if 10% do walk on the grass. Um, and we wonder about the following principle. Uh, we'll let, uh, some, uh, privileged racial minority. We're going to let, uh, I don't know, true, true people, of true Aryan descent or something, uh, walk on the grass. Um, and, you know, this isn't going to destroy the grass, and really it's not going to pose any special burden on anybody else, uh, because, um, uh, you know, everybody else is not going to be walking on the grass either way. Uh, or, you know, suppose uh, maybe we live in South Africa and, and the white population is less than 10% of the, the people, and we're, we're wondering should the, the white ruling uh, class be allowed to walk on the grass uh, when uh, everybody else can't. Um, and um, here Scanlon thinks uh, a principle that doesn't allow anybody to walk on the grass, that might be better than a principle that uh, allows uh, just the the white ruling class to walk on the grass. Um, and that's even though that, you know, that doesn't necessarily, you know, that do, there's no tangible harm involved 
in allowing some select group of people to walk on the grass uh, because they're not damaging the grass and the rule that says nobody can walk on the grass or this rule, you don't walk on the grass either way. Um, there's something offensive nonetheless in the idea of allowing uh, race to be uh, a legitimate ground for distribution. Uh, in other words, there's something disrespectful and offensive uh, to everyone else uh, and the idea of this rule that gives people certain racial privileges. And that might be a reason for rejecting the principle, even if it doesn't hurt you in utilitarian terms. Um, now, uh, a rule utilitarian might be able to tell some sort of story about why this is so. Well, you know, uh, in general, if you treat uh, race as a kind of privileged uh, characteristic that gives you certain advantages, that's going to decrease utility in other ways because blah, blah, blah. And that might very well be true. Uh, so maybe utilitarians can get the right result here. Um, but uh, the authors of the article here suppose that the contractualist might have an advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the sort of crude concepts objection uh, against utilitarianism. So we talked about the crude concepts objection when, I, when we talked about utilitarianism. Uh, we're going to see it more fully when we talk about Ross, but this idea that Utilitarianism, even when it gets the right result, it seems to get the right result for the wrong reasons. Um, it has to always get the, you know, it always has to explain why you should do a certain thing in terms of something about maximizing overall well-being. Um, and uh, it's not clear that morality actually, that our ordinary moral reason actually, reasoning actually works like that. Um, Often we think that the explanations of things are something other than uh, uh, maximizing overall well-being. The, the reason you should pay your friend back is not because rules telling people to pay their friends back maximizes overall well-being. It's some other reason. It's just because that's the right thing to do when, you know, you're friends with somebody. Um, uh, and so um, the SCP authors are thinking um, because contractualism cares about all this other stuff about fairness and uh, respect and these sorts of things, maybe it allows you to kind of get, get at the heart of the moral matter uh, more easily. Um, you don't need to go give some kind of galaxy brain explanation of how, say, racism decreases utility and that's why it's wrong is it you can just say look it's it's disrespectful and unfair and that's enough uh, for it to be wrong this is the thought um, a second difference has to do with how a contractualist from utilitarianism has to do with how a contractualist might handle aggregation aggregation has to do with summing up benefits and harms to different people, aggregating well-being across people. Um, so Scanlon thinks for a principle to be rejected, some particular person needs to have an objection to it, and uh, their objection needs to be based on reasons that have to do with them, right? I'm thinking about sort of the reasons I have to care about things and I'm going to object to principles on, on the basis of those reasons. So um, consider this counterexample, and I think we mentioned this in the, when we were talking about act utilitarianism already, but this comes from uh, Scanlon. Jones has suffered an accident in the transmitter room of a television station. Electrical equipment has fallen on his arm. We can't rescue him without turning off the transmitter. Uh, World Cup match is in progress. Uh, watched by hundreds of millions of people. Um, should we rescue Jones or should we wait until the match is over? And the thought there is the utilitarian seems to be, or the act utilitarian at least, seems to have to say that we should let this guy keep getting electrocuted until the match is over because, you know, the, the total happiness 
of the hundreds of millions of people watching the World Cup game, that outweighs the fact that he is being very, very badly shocked. But Scanlon thinks, obviously, you should turn off the transmitter and save the guy. Um, but Scanlon thinks the contractualist um, can, can get the result that uh, you should save the guy. And this is because what we're doing is considering kind of each particular person's objection to the principle and whether that outweighs the things that each particular person has to say uh, in favor of a principle. So the thought is uh, uh, Jones, the guy who's being electrocuted, his objection to a principle allowing him to be electrocuted, that's stronger than any particular one of the World Cup viewers objections to principles allowing us to turn off the transmitter. Uh, and it doesn't matter that there are so many more World Cup viewers. What matters is that this individual has a stronger uh, claim to being rescued than any particular World Cup viewer has to having the match not be interrupted. Scanlon thinks that's the right way to handle it on a contractualist view, and that means that uh, we should rescue this guy uh, and that's intuitively the correct result. Um, you might worry about a case where, uh, I mean, suppose I could, for instance, save a million people from dying, or I could save one person from dying in a slightly more painful way, a very slightly more painful way. You might think, well, obviously I should save uh, the million people from dying, but wouldn't what we just said imply that uh, I should save the one person from dying in a slightly more painful way because their their claim is stronger, right? It's worse for them to die uh, in the slightly more painful way than for any given one of the million people to die in the slightly less painful way. Uh, and Scanlon thinks, no, we can, we can get the result that I should save the million because if I save the one, each of the million can complain that I am failing to take their interests seriously by failing to consider that there are a million lives at stake. Um, they can think, look, there are a million of us, and you still save the one guy who's, who only had very slightly more at stake. And that's an objection that they can raise. We're sort of disrespecting them by, by failing to save the million and saving the one guy instead. And so we should save uh, the one. Now you might wonder, couldn't the World Cup viewers say, well, but wait, you're disrespecting us by, uh, uh, letting, uh, by saving the one guy instead of furthering the interests of us millions of people. And he thinks, Basically, well, it depends on whether there are like comparable amounts of well-being at stake. Uh, the, the million people who are going to die, they have something at stake that's comparable to the one person who's going to die in the slightly less painful way, slightly, slightly more painful way. Whereas that's not true of Jones and the World Cup viewers. Whether this is ultimately a, a, a consistent workable position is controversial, but this is what Scanlon thinks. Um, now, you might wonder, okay, well, why should we care about the terms of some hypothetical contract? I mean, it's not a real contract. You know, real contracts, if you break them, you go to jail or you get sued or whatever. Uh, this is uh, some hypothetical contract. Why should we care about that? Why should we care about the fact that in some set of circumstances that we'll never obtain, we would agree to some set of principles? Um, and this really is raising for contractualists this why be moral question. The why be moral question is this question, why be moral even if uh, it doesn't seem to benefit you, even if it's not what you want to do, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, here we wonder, okay, if what being moral amounts to is following the terms of this hypothetical contract, uh, then why should I be moral?
Um, and for Scanlan, the answer is going to be uh, that being moral um, constitutes standing in a certain sort of valuable relationship with other people. Uh, when you behave morally, you behave in ways that you can justify to others on terms that they cannot reasonably reject. And that means that you are standing in a relationship of mutual respect, mutual decency, what he calls mutual recognition with the other person, mutual recognition of one another's value. On the other hand, if you treat other people in ways that are not justifiable to them, you treat them in ways which, if we were to uh, try to reach you know, agreement about how we should treat each other, it would be reasonable for them to say, no, you're not allowed to do that to me. Uh, you harm your relationship with them. You prevent yourself from standing in this relationship of mutual respect with them. You give them reason to resent you. Um, and Scanlon thinks, you know, it's just sort of clear that you should care about your relationships with other people. If you just say, ah, oh, you know, relationships of mutual respect with other people, I don't, I don't see the appeal, then Scanlon's not really going to have much to say to you. You know, your explanations have to run out somewhere. This is where they run out. Um, but... If you can see that that matters, how you relate to other people, then you can see why it matters that you behave morally, because behaving morally just is behaving in ways that you can justify to other people on terms that they can't reasonably reject. Behaving, in other words, in the way that the contractualist says that you should behave. Um, and that, that just is standing in this important relationship. Um, so he says he's not a terribly good writer, unfortunately, but the contractualist ideal of acting in accord with principles that others could not reasonably reject uh, is meant to characterize the relationship with others, the value and appeal of which underlies our reasons to do what morality requires. Uh, in other words, um, uh, acting in accordance with these principles uh, is uh, achieving the kind of relationship that, that gives you reason to care about morality. This relation, much less personal than friendship, might be called a relation of mutual recognition. Um, it's less personal than friendship because you can stand in this relationship with people who are strangers to you, right? If some, some strange person, you act in ways that they can't, you couldn't justify to them that can harm your relationship with them. You're not friends with them, but you stand in this, this basic relationship of, of mutual recognition with everybody else, or you don't, based on how you, how you treat them. Um, so it's not a personal relationship like friendship that requires that you, you know, have a bunch of interactions with the person, all that sort of stuff. It's a relationship that you can stand in with, with just anybody. Um, at the same time, Presumably, it's a relationship that kind of underlies friendship and romance and all this sort of stuff. If you don't have this relationship with the people you're close to, you don't have this relationship of mutual respect, mutual decency, then the, your, your more personal relationship is not going to work out, right? Standing in this relationship to others is appealing in itself, worth seeking for its own sake. A moral person uh, will refrain from lying to others, cheating, harming, or exploiting them because these things are wrong. But for such a person, these requirements are not just formal imperatives, that it's not just some abstract rule that you're following and you can't explain why. Uh, they are part of the positive value of a way of living with others. Um, and this is also uh, the, the explanation of why you should be moral. Uh, that the good place settles on. So I hope that you'll uh, I hope that you'll be able to hear uh, and see this little.
Uh, so I, I hope that you all could could hear and see that. Um, if not, then I guess it was a weird couple of minutes. But uh, <laughs> you you can you can find uh, this is from the last episode of season two of The Good Place. If you have a, a way to watch that, it's from the last few minutes. Um, and what you see there is Eleanor has attempted to be a good person. Uh, and she feels like it's not paid off. She's gotten discouraged. Michael uh, asks her, isn't the question what we owe to each other? So she finds Cheedy uh, lecturing on Tim Scanlon. And um, Cheedy's position winds up being, uh, what is our reason to behave morally, even if you know we don't, we're not sure if it will pay off, even if we don't think that we'll get a reward? Uh, it's because of our bonds with other people. Uh, and that's Scanlon's answer too. Uh, the reason you have to behave morally is because of your bonds with other people. Um, and that's that. Now... Uh, as I say, <laughs> no one, uh, uh, none of, none of the views we discuss are, uh, uncontroversial. Um, there are two big objections to contractualism that we'll discuss. One has to do with animals. The other has to do with future people. So... Uh, it seems clear uh, to me and to most people that we have uh, at least some obligations to non-human animals. Wrong to torture a dog. Wrong for me to leave the house one day and leave my cats inside and let them die of dehydration. Um, but it's less clear whether it makes sense to think of animals as party to the social contract or to think of ourselves as justifying our actions to animals, given that they lack um, our, our rational faculties, right? I mean, my cats, at least they couldn't understand, you know, if, when I take them to the vet or something. Uh, the, maybe, I don't know, maybe they wonder why I do this to them. But, uh, you know, they couldn't consider a justification and weigh it and see whether it's good, that sort of stuff, right? Um, and similarly, you know, they can't agree to principles. They, they don't reciprocate. Uh, you know, if I say, I'm going to do this for you guys, you do this other thing for me, you know, they don't listen to that. Um, animals aren't really party to contracts in any way. So um, how can we include them? How can we explain our obligations to them in a contractualist framework? Um, Scanlon's original thought was that, well, we should think of the animals as having hypothetical trustees in the contracting situation. You know, a trustee, like if you're a little kid and you inherit some money, you're not old enough to dispose of it yet, or maybe when you're old, you get incapacitated somehow. Um, a trustee is somebody who kind of acts in your stead and is supposed to protect your interests, right? Uh, well, what we imagine is there are trustees in the contracting situation and they're going to protect the animal's interests just like we protect our own interests. Um, so, you know, if you, you want principles to allow you to torture a dog, then the trustee of, of the trustees of the dogs are going to speak up and say, no, you're not allowed to do that. Right. Uh, our, our clients' uh, interests are harmed by that. Um, the, uh, the authors of the SP, SCP article give um, what seems to me to be kind of an odd objection. They think a utilitarian might say that this provides um, <clears throat> too indirect an account of our obligations to animals. Um, Surely torturing the dog is wrong just because of the suffering the animal feels, not because you can't justify it to some hypothetical trustee. So it's kind of the, the reverse of the objection of, of the argument in favor of contractualism we were talking about a minute ago. Um, 
you know, there it was, the utilitarian gives kind of the wrong kind of explanation uh, of certain things. Uh, whereas the contractualist can get the intuitively correct one. Here the thought is, the utilitarian can just say, look, torturing the dog is wrong because the dog has well-being and it lowers the dog's well-being. And isn't that intuitively the right reason um, for torturing the dog to be wrong? Not something about some hypothetical trustee. Um, but I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think the way to understand the trustee model is, yes, I owe things to my cats directly. It's not like I owe them to this hypothetical trustee. I owe them directly to my cats. The, the trustee is just a device, right, uh, to help us think about how their interests uh, fit into the contracting situation. Um, the trustee is kind of like the Lorax, right? The Lorax speaks for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. Uh, when we cut down the trees, it's, it's not like the Lorax, it's not like we wrong the Lorax. The Lorax's thought is that he speaks for the trees and he's protecting their interests, right? Now, uh, Scanlon is going to say trees don't really have interests in the way that animals do. And so we can't quite wrong them in quite the same way. We'll see what he says about trees in a minute. Um, but when it comes to the animals, the thought is the trustees are like the Lorax for the animals. The animals can't be party to the contract, but they still have interests that we need to respect. And so the trustees are there to, uh, uh, to represent them, right? Um, you might think there is still a worry about this, though, because Scanlon wanted morality to be all about mutual respect and mutual recognition a certain sort of relationship and you might worry about whether you can stand in relationships like that with animals um, do they have the right cognitive capacities to you know respect you as a fellow agent and all that kind of stuff um, and if you can't then you might wonder well okay isn't isn't that going to exclude animals uh, from morality maybe Scanlon can't actually explain how the trustees should be in the contracting situation because maybe, you know, morality is about certain sorts of relationships and you just can't have those relationships with animals. Uh, and so then it seems like it would imply, oh, well, we shouldn't care about their interests when we drop the social contract. And then if that's right, that would be a problem because it would imply we didn't have obligations towards them. Um, so it seems to me um, a contractualist who wants to pursue the trustee model, well, they need to justify why is it that we need to care about the interests of animals when drawing up the social contract. And I think they have three options. Um, either they could try to show that we actually can be in this relationship of mutual recognition with animals, uh, or else they could try to show that there's some other relationship that we can be in with animals and that grounds moral importance. I do think I stand in certain sorts of relationships with my cats. I don't know if it's a relationship of mutual respect. I mean, do they respect me? I don't know. Certainly I, I, I stand in certain sorts of relationships of love, for instance, with my cats. I mean, I love them and I think they love me. Uh, maybe that matters. Um, or else maybe they can just give some other kind of explanation, give some, some alternative justification for why we need to care about the interests of animals when drawing up the social contract. Um, and it's worth thinking about all of those. This is not a, I mean, contractualism of the sort that Scanlon defends is pretty new as far as moral theories go, you know, I mean, the, we're talking about a, a view that's just been developed in the past few decades. Um, people aren't, don't yet agree about what the best way to spell it out is. Maybe one of you someday will figure this out. But it's worth thinking about which of these is the best thing for a contractualist to say. Um, what Scanlon himself ultimately wound up doing was rejecting this trustee model. Instead, he says... Well, maybe there's such a thing as what he calls broad and narrow morality. 
So narrow morality deals with right and wrong, deals with what we owe to each other. Um, broad morality deals with certain other things. There might be other things that are, you know, they're kind of like jerk things to do. They might be cruel or callous or insensitive or whatever. Maybe they're not exactly wrong, but they're still bad. Um, cutting down trees wantonly for Scanlan falls under broad morality. Trees have a certain sort of value, and if you go around, uh, you know, just destroying them randomly, uh, that says something bad about you. It's not that you owe it to the trees that you not cut them down in the way that you might owe it to a person that you not kill them. But nonetheless, it is bad. It, it, it's, it says something morally bad about you if you go around destroying trees randomly. And so the Lorax does have, does have a good complaint. Um, and Scanlon thinks maybe treatment of animals is like that. Uh, it's not that you owe it to animals not to mistreat them, but still mistreating them is bad in various ways. Um, but there are two worries that you might have here uh, about that move, putting animals under broad morality, but not narrow morality, not the morality of right and wrong. First of all, you might think it just seems, you know, like, according to common sense, it's clearly wrong, right? I mean, part of the motivation for contractualism was supposed to be, you know, fitting with some of our ordinary intuitions, so forth. Um, but you might think, obviously, we have obligations to animals. Wouldn't it be wrong for me to just let my cats die of dehydration? Don't I owe it to them to not do that? Um, and if that's right, then, then this move doesn't work. Um, second, um, if we say that animals fall only under broad morality, we might have to say that about some human beings too. Um, you know, babies can't be parties to contracts. They can't stand in relationships of mutual respect and recognition with you, or at least they can't obviously do that. Babies will later be able to do that, usually, but not always. I mean, sometimes people have certain sorts of disabilities or diseases that prevent them from, you know, developing certain capacities. Um, but it would be pretty bad, it seems like, if, if Scanlon says that we don't have any obligations to any of these folks. Um... And he ultimately, he thinks he can get out of it. He thinks he can say that, that we do have obligations to these folks. They do fall under narrow morality, even though he wants to say that animals don't. What he says is a little strained, I think. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll return to some of these issues later when we discuss animal rights. Um, <clears throat> the, the question of our obligations to animals and our obligations to human beings who, for one reason or another, don't have, you know, uh, kind of abstract reasoning faculties, that sort of thing. So you can put a pin in this for now. Um, there's also a second objection to contractualism. This has to do with the treatment of future people. This centers around what's often called the non-identity problem. The non-identity problem has to do with situations where you affect well, how well off future people will be, but you also affect which future people are going to exist. Um, so Derek Parfit, I've mentioned him a couple times in the class. We haven't run anything by him, but uh, he, he came up with the non-identity problem. He gives us this case. Uh, so Mary is deciding when to have a child she could have one in summer or in winter. Um, for some weird medical reason, uh, if she has the child in winter, um, the child will have some sort of chronic pain condition, let's say. And um, this will, you know, I mean, this will be a very bad condition. It will seriously reduce the child's quality of life. 
um, but not so much that it would be better for the child never to be born, right? So this person, the winter child, will have a life worth living, but it will be very difficult because of this chronic pain condition. Um, on the other hand, uh, if she has the child in summer, the child will be perfectly healthy, no chronic pain condition. Um, but the child will be different. You know, if you conceive a child six months later, it's going to be a different child. It's not going to be the same person, right? It's going to be a different sperm and a different egg. Um, for some reason, uh, Mary doesn't want to have a kid in the summer, so she opts for a winter birth. So she decides, knowing all of this, that she's going to have the kid with the very serious chronic pain condition rather than um, the healthier kid. A lot of people have the intuition that this would be wrong for her to do. She should uh, wait until summer and have the healthier kid. Um, but for contractualists, the whole point is what makes actions wrong is that somebody has a complaint about them, right? And so for a contractualist, if this is wrong, it has to wrong someone. But you might wonder, who, who does she actually wrong in this case? Uh, if she has the winter child, sure, the winter child has this chronic pain condition, but the winter child wouldn't exist at all uh, if, she didn't, if she didn't have the kid in winter. Um, and the winter child's life is worth living. Um, on the other hand, the summer child is never born at all, and so it doesn't exist, and you can't wrong people who don't exist, presumably. You can't wrong Santa Claus, you know, or Sherlock Holmes. Um, Basically, the non-identity problem, I mean, it's a very, very difficult uh, problem. Ethicists have written a whole lot about this. Again, no agreed upon conclusion. We may talk about it at greater length later on. Um, but uh, uh, one, one thing the contractualist might try to do is say that the winter child has a complaint. Um, even though they have a life worth living, um, and even though uh, Mary's actions were necessary for them to have any life at all. Um, maybe, for instance, you think Mary fails to appropriately respect the well-being of her future child when she has the kid in winter rather than summer. Um, and, you know, it turns out that the winter child is her future child, and he has a complaint about this, even though, given how things turned out, this was necessary for him to have a life, or something like that. It's, it's hard. It's a hard, um, it's a hard line to push, you know. Um, I'm, I'm just giving you, like I say, this is, very, this is a very difficult problem. I'm only giving you a little overview of different ways people might go. Uh, I'm not trying to go into all the details here. But um, Parfit thought that contractualists should give up claim two from the aggregation section earlier, um, which was the idea that for somebody to object to a principle, their objection needs to be based on reasons having to do with them. So you remember when we talked about Jones and the transmitter, Jones is being electrocuted. He can... Um, he can uh, say that we should let him out, let, we should turn off the transmitter because his objection is stronger than the objection of any of the World Cup viewers, right? And the World Cup viewers can't sort of aggregate their objections, right? They, each of them can only object on the basis of their own stake in seeing the match. Um, Scanlon, th or sorry, Parfit thinks that turns out to be unsustainable. Really, what we should be able to do is just object on the basis of facts about the overall value of the world. Uh, I should be able to object to a principle because um, it will hurt somebody else, or because it will make the world worse off from some from the point of view of the universe, uh, rather than just needing to object on grounds that have to do with me. 
And uh, if we go that route, then contractualism will wind up looking a lot more like rule utilitarianism because really what we'll wind up doing are settling on principles that produce the best results from the point of view of the universe, right? Um, we won't necessarily be maximizing welfare because Scanlon says, look, people can care about other things besides well, well-being, you know, stuff, respect, fairness, this sort of stuff. But um, we will be, you know, maximizing something that takes all that stuff into account. Um, Parfit actually agrees with this. So he wrote a great big book called On What Matters, which is on what matters. Um, and the main thesis of that book is that rule consequentialism, Kantianism, and contractualism actually all agree um, about what we should do in different circumstances. They actually all converge. I've been treating these as different ethical theories that have different results. Parfit thinks when you develop each of them into its best form, they turn out to be saying the same thing. Uh, on what matters originally was called climbing the mountain because the idea was consequentialists and Kantians and contractualists are all climbing the same mountain from different paths, but whoa, look, they wind up in the same spot at the end. Um, if Parfit is right about that, then that's very interesting, right? Um, if all these different theories actually converge on what you should do. Uh, we don't have time in this class to go into that. If you would like to read on what matters, <clears throat> uh, you can. It's very long. You only have to read the first volume to get the argument about this. Uh, perhaps another move, um, a contractualist might reject the claim that Mary does something wrong at all. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Gattaca. Maybe this is a dated reference by this point. Um, but the plot of Gattaca is the, the main character's parents sort of refuse to have him genetically enhanced. Uh, and you're supposed to sort of, you know, when, when they're uh, having a kid, they, they refuse to have a genetically enhanced kid. I guess it wouldn't have been him, right? It would have been somebody else if they'd gone to, you know, had the, the designer clone. Instead, they just, uh, they just, you know, have sex and conceive a child in the natural way. Uh, and you're sort of supposed to think that that's okay. So maybe you think, well, maybe it is okay when you can bring different different individuals into existence. Um, maybe it's okay to bring the less well-off individual into existence. Um, but you might think that there are other cases where that move seems maybe more problematic. Um, so suppose we refuse to implement uh, sustainable environmental policies, for instance. Um, and suppose it's the case that uh, uh, if we uh, if we do that, um, then you know, hundreds of years from now, people are going to be significantly worse off. But because of the butterfly effect, you know, different economic policies mean different people meet each other, or have sex at slightly different times, and so forth. Uh, hundreds of years from now, when everybody is is uh, worse off than they would have been, these also will be totally different people. And suppose that people in the resource depleted future, you know, life is maybe it's worse than it is for us now, even, but it's still just barely worth living. Um, it looks like you might, uh, given this line of reasoning, you might say, ah, so we didn't hurt anybody. All we did was create different people who have lives worth living. And so, uh, you know, we can enact the uh, environmentally unsustainable policy. But that seems wrong to most people. Or consider um, this case um, from Gregory Kavka, a famous philosopher. Um, Suppose uh, my spouse and I sell, uh, we sign a contract to sell our first child uh, to a slaver. Um, and because we signed the contract, we have the kid 
under slightly different circumstances than we otherwise would have. Uh, maybe the, the slaver rents uh, the honeymoon suite for us. Um, and so a different uh, sperm fertilizes a different egg. So we have a different uh, kid. Having signed the contract, suppose that there's no way we can break it. The guy will hunt us down and capture the child. Suppose that the child's life is going to be very difficult, but it will be barely worth living. So now we have a situation where um, our kid gets sold into slavery, but they couldn't have existed unless we had sold them into slavery. And they have a life that's just barely worth living. Um, if you say, well, you know, no one's wronged, right? Because uh, they exist, their life is worth living. Um, couldn't have existed otherwise. Uh, then it looks like you would have to say that signing the contract is okay. But signing the contract certainly doesn't seem to be okay to most of us. Um, so uh, it looks like maybe just biting, biting the bullet and saying that nothing, uh, you know, we don't wrong the people in these, or we don't act wrongly in these non-identity cases. In some situations, that seems awfully implausible. Um, so, uh, it looks like contractualists need to think about, you know, how to, how to respond to these sorts of non-identity cases. Like I say, we may, depending on what people want to talk about in the applied section, we may wind up actually coming back to these, to the, the non-identity problem. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the lecture on contractualism.